We're going to get started. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. We are celebrating Women in Construction Week uh, this week. Uh, we want to draw awareness to women in the construction industry. We're about 9% of the construction industry workforce at this moment. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and how do we get women more involved. But we're also going to talk about this idea of authenticity, specifically about women leaders uh, within the male-dominated construction industry. So we've got some great panelists for you guys to hear from, and we're going to start with just having you guys each introduce yourself. If you can tell us your name, where you're from, which company, what the company does, and then we'll jump in. Drew, you want to start? All right, I wanted to make sure this was on. So my name is Drew Wolfram, and I'm the Director of Revenue Operations here at Propeller. We're really grateful to have all of you guys here with us this evening. Um, in my role, I really work on day-to-day -day operations for our go-to-market teams to help us accomplish our goal, which is getting our really cool software and technology into the hands of the fabulous people in the construction industry and making their lives much easier uh, by making surveying much simpler, super accurate, helping them with time and savings, all of those good things. So, that's me. Um, my name is Chelsea Hewsome. Um, I own American GPR and Coring, so we do ground penetrating radar, which is concrete scanning, and then we do core drilling. Um, and I'm also an author and a speaker. Um, so started the company in March of 2020, and we've been growing very rapidly. And just, I'm so uh, grateful to be here. I'm excited to see all of you. Hi, I'm Carrie Hunter. I'm Vice President of Business Development for Sensera Systems. We're a tech company that's headquartered in Golden, and we manufacture site cameras for mostly our clients are like general contractors, oil and gas, but they're deployed to project sites and we do security and progress and uh, project management. So, um, but we're headquartered here in Golden. So. Hi, I'm Cody Cox. Uh, during the day, I am an associate attorney at Martin Hill. Um, we mostly work for GCs and help anywhere from contract to dispute resolution, arbitration, and all that good thing, all those good things that you don't want to call support, but you usually have to. Um, and then also, I am on the board for the Metro chapter of NAWIC, and so I'm the director of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm Lisa Hens. My company is called The Confidence Track, and I coach women on strengthening confidence and leadership impact. My tie to construction is I worked for Kiwit for more than nine years and led a team there, worked in their talent development group, and very excited to be here. Thank you. So we're going to get into the uh, topic of authenticity, but we thought we'd start it off with a fun question and let the audience get to know you guys a little bit. So um, I'll throw this to everybody. You can just go one by one. If you weren't in construction, what would you be doing and why? So Drew, you want to start? So if I wasn't in construction, is this more of like a dream job or a different industry? Okay, dream job, I would have my own vineyard in a really pretty countryside. And I would just spend my days outside with animals, drinking great wine, and eating good food, and just shutting off my brain a little bit. But I also love what I do today, so I guess it works. Um, well, I was a high school Spanish teacher for 10 years. Now I'm in construction. Like, tell me how that happened. But um, I would probably be a wildly famous speaker flying around in my private jet with Oprah and just, like, hanging out. <laughs> Um, I would probably be uh, back in the music industry. I was in the music industry to begin my career and um, did that for many years and then decided to make the switch over to my real career. So probably maybe when I retire. Back to what did you do in the music industry? Um, I was a jazz singer and uh, I play I play instruments too, but that's what I have an album. Sing us a song. Yeah. <laughs> that's afterwards. <laughs> Um, I would probably be on the jet too. I like to travel a lot, but um, I have a real passion for photography, so just taking a lot of pictures and experiencing different cultures and food and all that good stuff. Well, of course, I'm last after all of those. I would, uh, if I could get paid to just travel, that would be awesome. Like, not go there and work, but just travel and have fun and experience everything. So. 
There you go. Very cool. <laughs> Very cool. Um, the link is up here. So, um, private planes, music, like I think we've got a well rounded group. Um, jumping into construction, though, um, let's talk a little bit about authenticity and what does it mean to you in the context of your career within construction? And maybe we'll start with this way. I would say when, you know, when I think of that question, I think as a woman in a very male-dominated industry is to be an example of what is possible. I love that saying, and, and that really resonates with me, and I think the most important thing with that is be an example of what is possible first to yourself, but then also to other women. And, uh, you know, I positions that I've had, I've had younger women come up to me and say, it's so cool to see someone move up into a role within a construction company. And it's like, don't take it for granted. You're being an example for so many people. And that's a really important role to play, I think. Um, for me, uh, so to become a lawyer, there's seven years of higher education that you have to do. And so really, I had no idea of the complexity of this industry or what opportunities were even available. So really, for me, that whole educating and letting women know, like, hey, there are these opportunities that are available. You can be in this role. So spreading the knowledge and making sure that everyone just has access to the information. I think probably something along the same lines. I do a lot of... Um, a lot of my work focuses on women in construction and um, diversity in construction. And I think that that's just a conversation that just has to keep happening because it's still 9%, you know, it's for women, it's, it's very small. And um, I think it's really valuable because there's so many young people that are coming into their careers or getting out of high school and going into college and they're like, I don't, I don't want to go to college. I want to go into a trade. And can that work for me if I'm a girl? Like, is that something that I can do? Or just pushing STEM, I mean, even that kind of stuff. So I think that's, for me, that's kind of been the focus of the last, like, decade at least. Can you tell me the question here? Basically, what does it mean for you to be authentic in the field of construction? How, how do you share that? Um, okay, thank you. Um, for me, it's... Running a company, I get a lot of phone calls, and they're like, "Oh, you're you're the owner." I'm like, "Yeah, I am." Um, but it's it's just for me. Like, I'm from a small town in South Dakota. Like, what you see is what you get. Like, I and I think I'm really honest. So I think my clients appreciate that, and my employees appreciate that, and I'm genuine. But it's like if I can't help somebody, I'm gonna tell them, and I ask all the questions first, and to make sure I can help you. And if not, I'll send you somewhere else. Like, I'm not trying to pass up business, but. I want the best thing for you, and I'm going to tell you that up front now. So that's me just being real with people and saying, you know what, I would love to work with you, but that's not my scope, and I'm going to pass you on, and you know, so you have the best success. I think for me, it's continuing to challenge the status quo of what has already been sort of paved. And I think that women in construction have done a phenomenal job of paving the way for so many different roles to be occupied by females in the field and in different areas of the construction industry. But I think there's still a lot of preconceived notions about what the correct roles are, how far you can go, or how quick you can get there. And I think as a woman in construction, it's your job to keep pushing on that status quo, keep adding seats to the table, making your voice known, and really just making space for to bring up other people with you. Yeah, I think one thing that a couple of you guys talked about was just access to knowledge, or like how do we share with other women in the industry that these opportunities are available. And I'm just wondering how you guys found those opportunities, whether mentors that you had or, you know, whoever wants to answer that question, I'd love to know how you think about that. I had a, when I was young, I had a mentor that I first got into the construction industry in the beginning of my career. And, um, and it was kind of like I just fell into the position with this mentor and then it, he ended up being quite a, an outstanding mentor throughout my life, throughout my career, but um, but then I stepped away from construction and then came back to it and then realized, oh wow, that, that was really valuable <laughs> that I had that experience to begin with. So, I mean, for me, mentors were always like a really big deal. And now on the flip side, as at the, you know, in the later years of my career, mentoring is all, is very much a part of my process now because 
I, and still and still looking to mentors. Like I still want mentors, and I still I love mentoring younger folks because it just keeps you it just keeps you you know alert and active and engaged and um, and caring about what's happening around you. You know, I think that's um, it, it was accidental for me. So. Also, I have to answer that question. I fell into construction litigation, believe it or not. They're not teaching you about that opportunity, and it's very niche even within the legal uh, legal realm. So um, I fell into it, but my, you know, how you get work as a younger associate is through who you come up under. You have to find a good partner who's going to take you under their wing and say, hey, you can come to this meeting. This is what I do. So um, throughout my time or career, I just happened to be blessed with a good partner who saw something in me, even those days when I I don't think I can do it or I have imposter syndrome. They're like, no, you can do this. You're going to. And also, I don't have time to do it, so do it. And it's like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's the mentor that I need, so it's good. You just hit on something that we've talked about before the panel, which is this idea of imposter syndrome. Um, and I think women especially have that kind of, you know, as part of our makeup, um, and others as well. But I'm wondering how you guys, have you experienced that? How do you combat that? Um, how would you encourage other people to combat that? Um, I'm Can I swear? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, a few things, but like I have this little sticker on my desk that says, remember who the fuck you are. And when I'm like in it and I'm like, Oh gosh, no one's calling. You know, because sometimes you're so busy, and then other times, like, it's really slow, and you're like, oh my god, everyone hates us. What I do, like, what, you know, my company's failing or something. And I look at that, I'm like, okay, girl, like, you got this. And I, and honestly, at that, those times, I, I have to force myself to chill out a little bit and step away from the company, go outside, take a walk, walk my dog, like, do something that I actually enjoy and makes me laugh. And then, Five hours later, I missed like 10 calls and I have the week filled up with work. So it's like funny, I get like so in it and I get like so worked up and I'm trying to force it. And I'm like, no, just bring it back a little bit, chill out, and then like do what you're supposed to be doing and it will come. But it's like when we are trying to force it all, it just doesn't go well. I think I think the uh, imposter syndrome and the authenticity are really well matched because like in the construction industry, you're working with mostly men and you're going to naturally, you know, you're like, hi, I'm Sparrow, I just going to, even though that's not you, but sometimes you, you feel like that, you're coming in like that. And when you can be totally authentic, I think that can like immediately remove that. So, you know, you drop a couple of bombs or whatever your style is, you know, just being authentically yourself and not trying to like fit whatever, whoever thinks whatever about you, not trying to fit into that, but just being you. And people can feel that energy. People can tell when you're authentic. They say that authenticity is like the most powerful, you know, vibration. And it's true because when you're authentic, it kind of removes that imposter syndrome a little bit, I think. But so you want to talk about this one? Sure. So imposter syndrome is my passion topic. And I talk a lot about it at conferences and everything, and, and I struggled with it in a severe way to where I turned down a job promotion because I just, I, I didn't think I was deserving of it. I didn't think I was ready. And so you hear people saying, and I'll, and I'll see it on LinkedIn, they're like, hey, if you have imposter syndrome, congratulations, that means you're succeeding. And while I don't disagree with that totally, it's not very comforting for the person who's really going through it and struggling with it. It can feel kind of dismissive. And so to me, a big thing is just to find somebody to talk to about it because it can be very lonely and isolating. And there's this element of shame to it. Like, I don't want to admit to someone that I don't feel I deserve this role or whatever the case might be. So when you can find someone that you trust, feel comfortable talking with, oh my gosh, can make such a big difference. So seek someone out if you are struggling with it. It can really help. I think the old adage of you're only growing when you're uncomfortable, for me, that's what I lean into. Also, I'm just going, like, if it's uncomfortable, that just means I'm getting stronger. So, um, I want to go back to one of the things that you guys are just chiming about, which is this idea of conforming to certain expectations 
being a woman in the construction industry. So just wondering how, how have you guys navigated that while also staying true to yourself? So I think I've dealt less with trying to fit into a specific box and more the box being immediately placed on me in the construction industry. I think there's been a lot of interactions that I've had in which people assume that it's a husband or a boyfriend that they're talking about or that I'm taking the notes and I'm not there to do the presentation or these different things. And I think for me, I've really had to gain a lot of courage in those situations where maybe previously, I'm a people pleaser, just for anybody who doesn't know me very well. Um, I've had to really work on being able to be authentic and really stand up for immediately addressing who I am, what I'm doing there, what I'm bringing to the table, and not just letting it be comfortable with the assumptions that are placed on me. And I think that that is just something that I've noticed happens over and over in, in many male-dominated fields. This is just the assumption. They come in confident about it, and it's just about having that confidence back to make make your stance and say who you are, what you're there, and just be be confident about it. Do you have any helpful tips? Like, I know there's a silly one about standing in Superman pose before you go into... Everyone is yeah. right now. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, are there any things that you have done that you feel like have helped you to do that just naturally? I haven't done any Superman poses or pictured the room naked. I think for me, it was just enough times of being like, no, like, I am here for a reason. I have earned this. I am coming with a purpose. And like, no, you don't get to tell me who I am. I'm going to tell you who I am. And I, I don't know. I think it was just honestly irritation and anger over a period of time to where I was like, no, I'm, I'm not going to do this anymore. It might be the easier thing. But like, frankly, you know, we're going to make the best use of this time and you're going to respect me for who I am. So I think also know your shit. If you know your shit, then it's really hard for somebody to be coming back with that attitude. It's like you can just, you know, give the facts and themselves. So on top of that, also having a good mentor, sometimes I don't want to always have to do the fight or say like, hey, I belong here. And so there's so many times I go into the courtroom and they're like, oh, are you the paralegal? It's like, no, I am not. <laughs> um, and so my mentor, he'll say, you know, this is my associate, Cody Cox, and it'll never be like, oh, I'm your boss or whatever, and I'll introduce himself and be like, this is my colleague. Like, he's always made this level playing field so that I don't always have to stand up and know I belong here or whatnot. So finding an ally who's going to say, no, like, this is the boss, or no, we're on the same playing field. Like, no, go ask your questions to her. She'll tell you what to do. So that's been helpful as well. Um, I had a situation where it was a pretty large company that would provide me with all kinds of work if I wanted it. And they came to me and were like, well, you're a little bit, you're a little bit more expensive than some other companies. I'm like, okay. And, and I'm like, I'm not trying to be the cheapest company. I don't want to. We all know how that works out. The, the companies that go to the cheapest, uh, quote or bid, it never works out. It is like horrible. They all see it on the back end, right? All the change orders and just disaster. So I'm like, well, you know, I, we have value and my employees are really good at what they do. And so, you know, these are my prices, you know, I'm not going to lowball it just to get your business. If, and it, if you don't see value in what we do, that's okay. But like my clients who love us do see value in what we do. And that's the people I want to work with. So may, it was kind of weird. And I'm always like too nice. And I like oh my God, what should I say? You know, and, and maybe he thought because I'm a woman, I'd just cave and be like, yeah, I'll give you a special rate. But I didn't. And I don't work with them, but that's okay. I work with a, a bunch of other great people. So I think it kind of, some themes that I've heard are people pleasing or, you know, this was willingness to give in. And I think another thing we talked about before the panel was the idea that it's sometimes hard for women to self-promote. So it sounds like that's, you know, you, you do a great job of saying like, no, I'm worth it. Are there other techniques or how do you guys think about, you know, how do we effectively advocate for ourselves in the case that we don't have an ally? How do we show up and, you know, self-advocate? I would say, number one, don't, don't assume that your hard work will speak for itself. Um, you know, you put in the hours, you send the late emails, your boss sees you late at night. It's like, hey, that's okay. They see what I'm doing. Don't assume because you do that, that you will be noticed and you will be promoted. You are in charge of your career. And what I suggest to people is keep a success folder, like carve out 10 to 15 minutes on Fridays 
add in there, what did I accomplish this week? It doesn't have to take that long because if you wait until your annual review to try to think of all the stuff that you did for the whole year, you're not gonna remember hardly anything. Then proactively schedule a monthly meeting with your manager. Just go ahead and schedule it on their calendar. Go through and review the stuff that you did and then let them know what you're interested in. Let them know what you aspire to be because if you don't tell them, they, they can't read your mind. They're not sitting there thinking about you. They have so many other things on their plate. So to me, that's just a great way to advocate for yourself and to be consistent with it because if you do that, trust me, you will be noticed and you will differentiate yourself from all the people who are not doing that. Um, I leave myself notes, post to notes, all on my monitor, and it's just sayings that I'm, one of my favorite ones is, remember five years ago, or five years in the past, you were dreaming of where you are now, and that kind of reminds me, like, hey, I've come a far way, or, and I still have further to go, so let me just keep working, and then next year, I'll be remembering, and, you know, so it's on to that, but really just reminding yourself. So I need my own little daily affirmations or whatnot to just show up and be my authentic self. Yeah, I think um, maybe, I don't know um, I think one thing that I would say is women, we tend to apologize a lot and we tend to be like, oh, sorry. And like, we don't impose. And F that, you wanna impose. You wanna tell them what you're worth you want to ask for that money. What's the worst they can say? No, you're in the same spot you were before. So I think just remembering to be like confident in your, like, again, no, you should um, be confident in what you know and um, keep track of your successes so that you can fall back on that information really quickly if you need to. But I think stop apologizing and stop feeling like you're imposing is like, I think as I've gotten older and in my career is something that, uh, you know, you have to re maybe do like something in the mirror or something before you go in and just to remind yourself like this is where it's at, you know, and and you kind of walk into the room a little bit different. And again, what's the worst they can say? No? Okay, so you're at the same spot, you know? Um, no, no harm, no foul. But what if they say yes? And then you're that much further. So I think just, you know, getting out of our own way and... You know, if, if you were a guy, you probably wouldn't even think like that. You'd just be like, of course I'm worth it. And you'd walk in there and the boss would be like, okay, sure, Joe, whatever. Um, I think, like, when I was younger, probably 20 years ago, I let pretty much everyone in my life walk all over me. I'm, like, night too nice and I feel bad and, you know. And at some point, it's, like, enough of that. Like, love, finally love yourself and enough with all the crap and walk in there and be like, I know what I offer. I know who I am. And just, and like now I, people probably think I'm insane, but I like walk in rooms and I, I probably leave and they're like, oh my God, who is this lady? Because I just go in, I know my stuff, I do my thing and I'm like, this is me. And I leave it all out on the table and whether they love it or hate it, that's now the ball's in their court. But like at this point in my life, I know who I am, totally who I am. I love myself. I accept myself. And it's like, you have to come to a point in life eventually, and it might not be all the way, but like there's so many women and people that they don't love themselves or they're so self-conscious. Like, what do you have to do to love yourself? What work do you have to do? What healing do you have to do? We've all been through so much shit, like truly. I, it's like, you have to figure out how to be okay and love yourself, and that will change your life, how you like approach, how you go into work, how you go into life. Everybody had fantastic answers up here. I think the one thing I would add is that in some cases, it's take that step outside your comfort zone or maybe those day-to-day -day things and sort of show show some of the like extra thinking or skills that you have and like solve the unsolvable problem or like do like the little bit of extra thing there that makes your boss's life a million times easier. I think that those kind of things, like your day-to-day -day responsibilities, absolutely phenomenal to nail those. But sometimes those little things where you can really demonstrate that next step level of thinking or that impact can go such a long way too in advocating for, hey, like hear me roar, this is what I can do. This is what I can provide as value to the company. Like listen to sort of what I want and how I want to grow. And I think that can make a big impact as well. 
I think also, I had a mentor once that was like, um, when you come in to a situation, you know, people will be like, oh, that sucks, I'll complain about the situation, but come in with a resolution. Come in thinking and, and providing a resolution because it's so much more powerful than agreeing with everybody else at the table that, yeah, that really sucks. Um, it's so much more powerful. And I, I heard that probably in my late 20s, and it changed how I handled business moving forward after that. Very good. Um, again, this theme of mentorship keeps coming up, and I know about Maywick. Um, I wanted to know if you could give just a, a little spiel about Maywick um, for those in the audience that may not know about it, but then are there other organizations that you guys belong to um, that kind of foster that mentorship or that dialogue? So I love Maywick, and I love to talk about Maywick, um, but Maywick stands for National Association of Women in Construction, and we have a lovely Denver chapter. Um, there is a table over there with more information if you'd like to join, um, but it's really just a community of badass women and construction supporting each other and just really we have, you know, site visits, we will have speakers come in, we will have leadership conferences. So um, if you are interested, please talk to me or Gail or Jackie, um, and we can give you guys some more information. I'm part of an organization. It's WTS. It's Women in Transportation. I think it stands for Women's Transportation Symposium. But it's a national organization, and the Colorado chapter is, I think, one of the biggest and most active in the country, actually. You go to their events, and I mean, there, there are hundreds of people there, but they do a phenomenal job. I'm on their professional development committee, and I think it's always great to get involved with on a committee because you really get to know people and establish relationships. And actually, tomorrow I'm leading a webinar for them on imposter syndrome. So if you're interested, find me on LinkedIn. I, I posted it. You can still sign up for it, but, um, but it's a great organization to consider joining. It's a little bit less formal, but one of the things I did a bit more early in my career that I should really get back to is I would go on LinkedIn and I'd look for local people in the area who were doing the job that I wanted to do, who had the experience, who had the connections, were maybe at a company that was something that I would be interested in. And I would just reach out and see if they could get a coffee, if they could spare 30 minutes. Really, nobody says no. People love to talk about their career and what they've learned and share that information with people who are interested. And it's a great way to meet mentors and, um, and sort of, it's not necessarily industry specific, but you'd be surprised what you can get from a cold reach out on LinkedIn and just how welcoming people are and how willing they are to give you some of their time. We're gonna do two more questions and then we're gonna open it up to the uh, audience. So get your questions ready. Um, we haven't really talked about parenthood and how that might affect um, you know, career growth, career aspirations. So, just wondering if any parents are on the panel and how you kind of juggled that um, with your own kind of career growth. Did you change anything about how you approached work and how did you navigate that? Um, so I have two boys, they're seven and ten. Um, the little one we call the honey badger. He's, he's crazy. Um, during COVID, I was working two jobs in my home office and he got completely naked, climbed a five foot wooden fence and ran away. And I'm not joking. I'll show you the picture if you want later. I, my neighbor texted me a picture of his little naked butt walking down the sidewalk and she's like, you got a streaker. I'm like, oh my God, why? <laughs> so yeah, to say to juggle it is insane is yeah, an understatement. Um, it's, it's hard. It's great. But like the little guy is like, mom, you're the boss. You're the boss mom, right? And I'm like, how bad I am. He, I, I hope someday that I try to, you know, have the balance and things like that and, and do things and spend time with them. But like, all I hope is that they look at me and are proud of me, that mommy built something. She She's a hard worker. She taught me to work hard and she built something. That's all I want. And it's not always easy, but like this next week, I'll be skiing with them Monday, Tuesday, and then I'll go back in the hotel room, let them swim and I'll work. You know, you, you can make it work for you. Um, you just have to be cognizant of it. Well, I have an old kid. I have a 25 year old daughter. So it's been a long time. It's, you know, for me to remember. But uh, I just remember working my ass off. I was a single mom when she was, I got divorced when she was two. So it was like, 
it was like me or nothing. And um, I think just the biggest, when I look back at that, um, the biggest takeaway is just like keep going. You may have to make changes in the career choices that you pick. Um, part of the reason I went out of the music industry and went into some of my regular career was because I had to make more money. And um, I had to decide, okay, you know, what, but that's part of life and it'll lead you down different paths. But like, you can do both. It's very hard to do everything all the time. So you just have to give yourself grace for some days you cannot do it all. Some days you're like, my kid just threw up all over me and, and that's what's up and I am not going anywhere like this. And then other days you're like, I have to get a babysitter because I have to do this presentation. So you just have to give yourself room. I think sometimes, especially women are like, oh my God, I have to do everything and I, and I can't, oh my God, I could never possibly say my kid just threw up all over me. But, you know, like you just, it's life, it's life and it happens and you can do both, but you just have to give yourself some grace both ways. Okay. All right, last question. We'll make it a little bit more fun. Um, what is something you love about construction that people wouldn't expect? I guess for, from somebody who was not in construction until I was at Propeller, I think I just didn't understand, I guess, how complex truly like the depth of these projects are. And it literally is the backbone of all of our society in terms of how we get anywhere, what we build, like it, it's just in everything and it's so essential to everything. And I think it's a very overlooked industry and an industry that's not considered very glamorous or not like, you know, a hot growing industry or whatnot. Um, and I think for me, it was just one of those things where when you really dig into it, it's so cool. There's so many opportunities. It's ever growing and it's so impactful. I always wanted to work in an industry that had an impact and I never really thought construction. And then we got into this and we started you know, digging into how we're impacting our customers and just all of these great people with different backgrounds. Um, so I feel like it's just one of those things that you sort of overlook and then you get into it and you're like, oh, this is cool. I hope, I hope more people want to come, come and do this. Um, well, I love the people, but that is something they would expect, right? Or we would expect. But honestly, I think it's so cool that we're all building things. Like, to kind of piggyback off that, like, like I live in Castle Rock, and it's so cool to me for my kids to be like, my mom helped build that library. My mom helped build that hospital. And I'm like, yeah, I did. That's really, really freaking cool. And, it, like, we're all building things that people live in and travel in, like DIA, all these other things, right? And that's just so cool. Like, we're all building things people live their lives in. So that's just I think it's the, I think actually it's the authenticity because it, it's like the most authentic, like, I mean, for real, like you get on a job site, it's like, that might kill you, back it up, you know? <laughs> so I, I think, I like to live my life like that. So I really like being around people that are like that, like kind of no bullshit, just this is what it is. And um, I think that is probably my most favorite thing about the construction industry. So I'm a numbers girl and, um, I love how expensive these projects are. <laughs> I didn't realize how much money went into it, and then I'm litigating, and I'm like, 400 million for that? Is that broke? <laughs> so for me, like, I just, I had no idea. And now when I hear the numbers, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm on a, you know, 10 million case. It's a small one, and my friends are like, what? <laughs> like, like I just settled for a thousand bucks, it was a good day. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, no, we're, we're all about the numbers here. <laughs> I think, I guess the cool thing is so much career opportunity within the construction industry. I mean, you think about it, proposals, you know, the business folks, the, the attorneys, I mean, everything that, and I think it might have been mentioned before that I don't think a lot of people know how many career choices they might have within the industry, which is part of our responsibility too, is to educate people that there's so many different roles. It's not just out there on a project site. There are a lot of things running the business behind the scenes. So I think that's a really kind of surprising thing when I stepped into it. All right, do you want to open it up to the audience? Any other questions for our panelists? Oh, I have a pretty loud voice. Uh, I, this is from the perspective, I, I have three daughters, and so one thing that I'm looking at is like, what, what are the things that are going to be impactful for them that are going to look back and 
think, hey, this helps project me um, in my career. And is there anything, my question would be, is there anything when you were growing up, uh, like going down to youth level, is there anything you wish you would have either started sooner um, or gotten more involved in at a younger age, I would say? I would say teach them to love themselves young. Teach them to be passionate. Teach them to be confident. Because that, if you instill them, instill that in them young, like they will go out and they will do amazing things no matter what. Like that's so important. And I wish more, more parents would, you know, not like parents aren't doing it, but I wish more girls felt that when they were young. Yeah, I think having like your parents, especially your father for a girl, like really believe in you and say to you, like, whatever, you want to be a truck driver, cool, you can do that. Or you want to be a ballerina, you can do that. But if you, but if like kids don't have that, I think the other the thing I wish I would have done earlier in my career, much earlier, um, in my 20s, like right away, is get mentors. Because there are so many, like there's so many women or men, I mean, I have a lot of male mentors, um, but there are so many people that can help you with all the mistakes they made that you don't have to then make, and you're that much farther ahead. Um, you know, it just wasn't as popular. It wasn't as big of a buzzword back then. And I wish, I wish I would have started earlier. Luckily, I just, you know, came upon some really great mentors. But I wish I would have, like, if you know, that would have been the first thing I would have. I think for me, it's exposure. Like, expose them to as many aspects as you can and just get them involved. I know there's, um, is it girls? Oh, no, girls. There's, there's, yeah, there's a day every year for girls in transportation. And it's just a bunch of vendors. They have, like, opportunities for kids to get in and really just experience them. So, like, for me, my parents didn't always know these events. So like getting out there and researching and then pushing your kids into it just so that they can see like, oh, you know what? I like that aspect or, you know, I don't really like to get dirty. I was that kid. I did not like to get dirty. And I was like, no, but I'll, I'll do the behind the scenes. So just really giving them the opportunity to try and see what they like. I would say based on my, what Cody said, get them off their phones their iPads, get them out, tactical things like, so I live in Parker and the Pace Center, they have a science day and science night events and I've gone to them and they are phenomenal. Like what they show people, even as adults, not just kids, but it's like, wow, like I never would have even considered that. But like you said, exposure, I think is huge at that age. It's five minutes away from me, so. <laughs> the one little thing I'll add in there is helping them maybe break some of the like, little habits that I wish my parents had helped me with when I was little in the sense of like, there's a time and place to say sorry, absolutely. But as an adult, I say sorry way too much about things that I absolutely do not need to say sorry about. So helping them catch just those little things that are going to be confidence builders down the road is going to make a huge difference because there's those subtle things that we accumulate. And when we get to adulthood, it, it, it's just really hard to shake that. So I would say just help them be confident. Thank you. I see that women in particular say sorry at the beginning of those sentences. Guilty. <laughs> I do not. Um, what advantage or advantages do you feel like being your true, authentic self has given you over the years? I'd say way more real experiences. You know, when people know that you're authentic, they're, when they come at you way more authentically themselves, and they understand that, like, this is just I'm saying, this is me. And they're like, whoa, that lady's crazy. But at least, like, <laughs> at, least they know. at least they know and they like come back at you authentically. There's like less bullshit. So I think it I think it does cut out a lot of bullshit. This dog loves. <laughs> uh, uh, I think it just cuts out a lot of the a lot of the crap that you can't, you don't want to deal with. It cuts out a lot of that when people just say I think it gives people the opportunity to also be authentic. So to your point, yeah. I, if I know you're crazy, then I can be crazy. Yeah. If that's me, then I can show up that way. I think it also allows other folks to do that as well. I think it's contentment, too. It's tiring when you're trying to be somebody else, right? It's exhausting, and it's miserable. And so there's an element of just... 
being happier and more content with your life. Also, too, trying to show up as someone else or who you aren't, like, it's uncomfortable. <laughs> and I just wanted to be comfortable. Like, so really just embracing who I was and what I had to do. Um, I remember when I was first going into the profession and someone said, you can't wear braids if you want to be a lawyer. I'm like, well, there's a crown act, sir, and I'm allowed to wear my hair naturally, but we can talk about that later today. You know, just to show up and be comfortable, like be yourself. I just was too tired of always being uncomfortable in the room or trying to be someone that someone else wanted me to be instead of myself, which is awesome. So, And I have never regretted being authentic. I have, however, regretted trying to like tame it down a little bit to fit into a particular conversation or something. I always regret that. And so I don't do it very, it's very rare that I don't do that or probably most of it's gender, but um, I don't ever, I've never regretted being authentic, like in the aftermath of whatever it comes to. Um, I think, um, sorry, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> um, in the world of like all this fake stuff, on social media. It's just a bunch of crap. I'm sorry. Like you, these women take like a thousand pictures. Like I was in Italy last year. I turned 40 there and there's my husband's like, there's another one. They're all like over there. The, you can tell the man is the husband is like miserable. See, taking a thousand pictures of this lady again. She's so fake. She's so done up. It's like, that's so ridiculous. And what are you showing young girls? Like you're showing them fakeness. And that we, and you're making us feel bad about ourselves. And like when I was a teacher, girls would say like, I don't even like going on Instagram because it just makes me feel bad about myself. I'm like, then get off it. Like, stop. I go on social media and cry a lot. I'm like, this happened and like this. And honestly, just cause I'm like, here I am. And honestly, the messages I get are people like, thank you for just saying what I felt, but we feel this need to be perfect all the time. And we're not, and that's not fun. Let's be weird. That's the way we're fun. Anything different or any barriers to being authentic in the workplace? Does that look different for women versus men? That's a good question. I think yes, because I think that women just by default are going to carry more like emotional baggage with being authentic and the perceptions of what that looks like. I think it's just naturally and, and not for everybody. I don't want to assume all men are just comfortable being being themselves, but I think there's just that natural level of like oh, okay, like I can just show up and do all of this. I think as a woman, you're thinking about every little thing a lot. Like I think we're a lot of overthinkers, generally speaking, and we're worried about how we're perceived and all of those things. I also think authenticity, despite gender, looks different for everybody. I think sometimes people are like, oh, being authentic means that you're sharing X, Y, and Z about your life or you're doing this. And that looks different for everybody. For me, it's really just that you feel comfortable and you don't have to mask a certain part of yourself. It doesn't mean... You have to share everything and anything under the sun. And I think that'll look different, again, between genders and then, again, between people. So it's different for everybody. Probably that emotional baggage is very different between everybody. Um, and I think it's a very personal thing, again. Um, for me, I love when people underestimate me. I'm like, oh, yeah, I think I can because, like, that motivates me more. And when I show you what I can do, when you thought like, oh no, you can only rise this high and I'm here, it feels so much better. It feels amazing. So yeah, there's barriers, but people are placing them and I, you know, I'm gonna keep climbing over them or breaking them at, like I have been. And we're trained <laughs> to prove people wrong, break through these back barriers. So women are strong, like, and they don't give us credit for it. And so it's nice to prove people wrong. I find satisfaction in it. Nice. I love surprising people too. Like, you know, I think a lot of times, like, oh, she's going to cry. You know, it's like, no, I'm not. But I might come in authentically myself and they're like, oh, okay, that's, that's so sorry. So I, I think, you know, it can surprise people a lot too, just like, be super refreshing, like, let's get weird, you know, like, whether you're weird or not, but um, it can be refreshing and surprising, and, and you, a lot of times, that'll, like, totally take people off, you know, catch them off guard, and then whenever they were thinking, like, oh, should they cry, or whatever, they're, like, totally forgot what they were thinking. And I think it's just deeper connection. When we're real, 
we get past the crap, the fakeness, and we get to real connection. Hi. <laughs> um, what's like step one? Like all of y'all are lovely and awesome and like doing really amazing things, but like what's step one to like getting there? Like I teach a lot of students and like Gen Z and all that stuff and like I'm like, oh you love yourself, you're great, but like what's step one? Like what got you there? Like you can say love yourself, but like how do we do that? How do we start that? Like and get there to where all of us are, right? Because if you're here and you're like, wow, that's really awesome, but you don't know how to do that, like, what's a good way to start? I think knowing what you care about is like the first thing because there's so many people like, you hear it all the time. Oh, I went to college, this is my degree. I, I, I got a degree in anthropology, what do you do? Oh, I'm a dancer. <laughs> like what? Uh, like they, there's a disconnect completely like because it's just this like, like automated thing, like I finished high school, then I went to college, and I got this degree, and I'm not even doing anything with it. So I think um, turning the autopilot off and like from a young age encouraging individuals to have passions about what they care about. Like if you love dogs, great, go there. Like there's careers there. Um, because I feel like there's just like a lot of people kind of autopiloting in. And if you don't have passion, then you're just gonna be like into your career, and you're gonna be like 27. 34, and you're like freaking miserable, and you're gonna be like, what did I do all those years? Why did I even bother with that degree? Why did I even go work for that crappy company? You know, like, so I think teaching people to to recognize that passion really early, then their their life is their passion, and you do a job that's your passion, and it's like it's not work at all. You know, it's like you're just getting to get paid for what you love to do. Um, I would say start them off with understanding who they are. Before I could be myself or be authentic, I had to really self-reflect and say, well, well, who am I? And that's a harder question to answer if you haven't taken the time to do the work and say, oh, you know what? I'm a person who likes to get up early in the morning. I like to work hard. I like to see these results. But, like, what job is that? So, like, first I had to understand these things that drove me who I was and then I could see like oh well I could fit in here I could do that and then like the possibility started to open up I think for me when I uh, I when I found true like joy and fulfillment was when I got into personal development and like knowing who you are what are you passionate about what matters to you and like how are you building that into your life and making that a priority um, and really personal development changed everything for me. And it's like, you know, and also I think being comfortable to be by yourself. Like I've seen, I weirdly love being by myself and I'm like rarely ever by myself. I have to lock myself in rooms and stuff and hide. Um, but um, like I, I go to movies by myself. I sit in the back row, I laugh, I cry. It's freaking awesome guys. I go to eat. Oh, I always go out to lunch by myself or do different things. And I live by myself and people are like, Oh my God, I could never live by myself. And I'm like, there's this weird culture of like the codependency of having like roommates or a partner always. And like, it's because people don't love themselves, right? You have to like do the work and do the personal development, the self-development, find your joys, find your passion and your non-negotiables in life and what's important to you. And set, if, if, they, if kids could find that younger, I feel like they, they're just set up for success so much more. Um, wh when you made that leap towards being your more authentic self, was it out of frustration? Was it more because you mentioned it being exhausting of always trying to fit these uh, emotions of others? Or was it kind of just you saying, you know what, I want to try something different? And then was it one moment that all of a sudden you felt comfortable and you're like, I'm going to keep doing this? Or did you have to keep working towards it? So I think a combination. I think there was definitely, like I said earlier, some frustration and some like, oh, I'm just over this. Uh, but I think too that I knew if I wanted to really be able to continue to progress well in my career that I needed to sort of cut the bullshit, for lack of better words, and just like really approach it as myself with the skill set that I have, with the personality that I have, and, you know, find a place where, you know, I'm going to be able to get along with people and I have a good place to grow. Um, so I think it's a little, it was a little bit of both, um, I think, at just sort of the right time.
for me, really the big turning point was Propeller. And I had never come out at any of the places I worked at prior to Propeller. And I didn't come out during the interview process with Propeller. But all through the, the process, I got invited to the holiday party before I started. And it was all, do you want to bring your partner this? All of those things. I was like, oh, nobody's ever just said partner versus boyfriend or husband. Okay, that feels good. And then it was just no biggie. And I had never felt that relaxed. And I was like, okay, this is different. This is a different place. And it gave me that confidence to keep being authentically myself. There was still like a lot of growing and figuring out how to emulate it to, you know, the people who worked for me on my team, doing it back to my boss, my coworkers, because again, really you want that, you want everybody sort of being authentic because then you're really able to cut through all the crap and be efficient and have good relationships. But I think Propeller did a really good job of sort of giving me that little door opening to be like, all right, I'm done. We're doing this. And I think it's one of the reasons I've been here so long and, you know, been able to grow in my career the way that I have. So definitely thank you to Propeller for, for being so inclusive. Uh, for me, I always put myself in the most uncomfortable position possible. For example, I moved to Spain. Knew a little bit of Spanish, not a lot, and I was just like, thrive, thrivers. <laughs> you know, like, it's like, okay, I need to order food. I really wish I would have paid attention in Spanish class, but I'm going to figure this out. And when you're really in these positions where you're just alone with yourself and you have to get to know, like, that was the moment for me where I was like, okay, who am I? Am I going to be successful? I survived. <laughs> um, I ate well. <laughs> All the paella, but, um, it, it, you know, it's, that was like the moment for me. It's just like constantly putting myself in a situation where I didn't know if I would be able to do it or not. And then really having to have this inner battle with myself of like, okay, who are you? Like, are you going to be able to get this done? Like, how are you going to succeed? And how do you show up for yourself in these situations? Sometimes you need someone in your life who is honest and will just point it out. I uh, was with my sisters, and you could lock us in a dungeon, and we would laugh and have the best time ever. And, you know, all of these get-togethers, my one sister looked at me, and she's like, you don't smile anymore. The spark is not like, what? what has happened? And she said, I've noticed it for years. I've just never said anything. And honestly, it made me cry. Because I, I felt it. I was miserable all the time for years. And this is what's scary. What you repeat is what you become, right? I'm working on a program right now about habits and creating the habit of confidence because we have so many bad habits. And when you do it for years and years, you don't even know you're doing it anymore. And then you look in the mirror someday and it's like, I don't even know who this person is. But it took my sister to give me that punch in the gut where it's like, okay, I've been miserable for so long, it's time for a change. And then you have to decide what that change is. Um, I just want to address, like, is it one day and then you're changed forever? Like, I don't think for any of us it is that one day and it shouldn't be because I think you, as humans, we should want to grow and be better, right? And and constantly be evolving and be a better version of ourselves. So we, you might like they've talked, there's like maybe a situation that gets you where you need to be, but I think it's never like final and done. You keep going from there. Next, you want to buy a question? Uh, well, guess what? Sure. <laughs> um, so I, I'm about to go start a new project and I will be the project manager on it and the only girl in this project and kind of the youngest. So there's a lot of pressure of like stepping into the role and I am trying to implement more of this authenticity in the team and kind of empowering more women on the job side and all of these things. But I am a bit worried about it being perceived as being too feminist or like too over the top and things like that, you know? Uh, what would be your advice on like how to navigate through this whole process without being perceived as like, oh, she's just being a bitch boss and we're, we're done with her? I think the tough thing in the way that you said the question is we can't really control how we're perceived, right? So I think that you can go into this very confident, trying to push the authenticity, and I think you absolutely should, but I think sometimes the change and implementing the change is a little bit uncomfortable and does require 
you know, a little bit of that pioneering of being like, hey, like, if, if people seem like they're perceiving it in that way, having some of the conversations of like, why, why is that, that you think that, you know, I'm, I'm pushing an agenda here? Or like, what is it about what I'm doing that makes you feel this way and starting that dialogue? I think in any of these situations, it's just, it's always going to be, it, actually, it won't always be an uncomfortable start. Sometimes people surprise you. And I think that's another thing that I've learned is sometimes I assume people are going to take it way worse or have a very different reaction than what what actually happens. So I would say you can't control perception. You also don't know exactly what's going to happen. So I think it's one of those things where you just have to emotionally and mentally prepare yourself for the variety of possibilities and then just continue to sort of push forward and have that open dialogue. But I definitely commend you for, for wanting to do that. I think it's very brave. And I think that's what we need in the industry is more women doing that and continuing to push for that in their, their different situations. I think stop worrying about what other people think. That's like the number one thing I think in any career or any industry, but especially in construction for women, Stop worrying about what people think, and when you are starting to think about, like, you're starting to, like, oh, I'm worried about this, think about the why you're doing it, because the why you're doing it is going to inform everybody, and probably people, there, there will always be, like, you know, negative knowledge, it's just like, eh, let's kill, like, on every idea you have, but there's also a lot of people that are like, oh, that's cool, like, we've never done that before, and that's super fresh, and I actually really like that, you know, so... I, I would say, like, every time that, like, worry thought comes into your mind, just switch it to the why you're doing it. And also that will inform you, am I just doing this because it, like, sounded good, or is there, like, a real why to this? And then when you have that why, maybe maybe some of them you'll be like, that, I'm going to do that, that's, that's silly or whatever. Or you'll say, like, no, that's so cool, like, you should totally do that, and this is why. And then it, it'll, it'll stop your mind from being thinking about the worry, and it'll be, keep you focused on why you're doing it and why you thought it up. And I think your goal is to bring the best people in to perform on that job, right? That's You want success for that job, whether it's men or women, right? So if you're giving an opportunity to women, you know, contractors or different companies, they should be the best at what they do. And they're coming in, they're, they're killing it. They're setting the standard and everyone else is like, dang, yeah, I see why you brought them on, right? They're amazing. And they see what value they add. But it's, I don't think you should just bring people on if they're not the best, right? And because then the job's going to not be as successful. So I think their work will stand for itself and it, they, it will impress people.